thank you everyone for coming. This is our uh, fourth and final Navigating Through Disruption webinar. And today we're talking about Meet of the Matter uh, Beyond COVID-19 with our special guest, Sylvain Charlebois. I'm Shannon Snaden. I'm the Marketing Specialist with Plant Protein Alliance. As well, we have Barb Wilkinson, who's the Communications Manager, and Sylvain Charlebois, who is a uh, professor at Dalhousie University. Uh, the Plant Protein Alliance is all about connecting people in Alberta and, and throughout the prairies to become global leaders in plant-based ingredient processing. We're a fairly new nonprofit, just over, over a year and a bit old. Last year, we had 13 different networking events, and we've just recently moved towards doing online events as well with this first webinar series. We also have two different monthly newsletters that are very interesting, have lots of different news articles about plant proteins and the agriculture industry. And you can sign up for that on our website, ppaa.ca. We also do have members. So if you're looking to support value-added processing of, of products in Canada, you're welcome to join. We also have a, a promotion right now, get three months extra with your sign up. And for students, the price to join is as low as $25. It goes a little bit higher for bigger organizations. And in the question and answer period, we'll be having a draw. So if you're engaged and typing in questions in the chat box, we'll be doing a draw for one membership for Plant Protein Alliance for the 13 months. Please, your questions ready for Sylvain. Some good challenging questions would be great. Our feature presentation, looking at disruptive trends in the food industry. I'll let you take it from here. All right. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. And uh, thank you for the invitation. I was looking forward to this uh, session there's been a lot of discussions uh, around, well, around the future of food, really, what's going to happen uh, after we've, uh, we've gone through COVID, what are going to be the trends, uh, how will consumer relate to food in general? So lots of questions. Uh, here at the lab at Dalhousie University, we have uh, anywhere between 22 to 25 employees working on different research projects. We currently have more than 10 projects related to COVID now. And those projects range from gardening to tipping to the future of food service. We're, we're also looking at, at plant-based dieting. We've looked at food waste uh, at FarmGate. Uh, most recently, just last week, we uh, released a new study. And I encourage you to go on our website at, Agri-Food, uh, at the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University, and you'll find all of these reports. They're all, they're all free. And we produce uh, reports on a regular basis. But because of COVID, of course, we've been very much focused on on what's been happening, a lot of people have called us asking us questions about uh, food shortages, empty shelves, supply chain management, uh, and on all of these terms replace terms that we're hearing before COVID, which was which were sustainability, plant-based dieting, uh, animal welfare, uh, single-use plastics. All of these terms were very popular before COVID hit. And then, of course, there was panic. Uh, people were just wondering what is going to happen. And so we saw some stockpiling, people just buying everything and anything, trying to get, uh, trying to get a sense of what was going on. And, and people were forced to think about two weeks of food instead of just two days. And uh, we were asked to cook. And uh, we've been cooking a lot more. And so there's been a lot of changes in our lives over the last 10 weeks. And if you haven't keep, if you haven't keep up with your calendar, we are in week number 10 of this pandemic since March 13th. That's when I think it all started in Canada, really. And so, frankly, it's been really wild and interesting uh, at the same time for, for us at the lab as social scientists. Uh, but it, it does get it forces us to ask questions about well what's what's going to happen to plant-based dieting is there a future is 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 we there was a path before covid it will that path will we continue on that path moving forward will beyond meat still exist and so on and so forth um i'm for my presentation i thought of just kind of uh, of going back in time a little bit before, before COVID, which seems to be a thousand years ago, and give you a picture of what was going on in Canada and then look at what has happened since during COVID and then 
look at the future, and then we'll actually have a. I'm hope I'm hoping that we can actually have a very interesting conversation. Uh, and I know that Shannon will be looking at questions. And so, please, if you have any questions at all uh, to ask, uh, just send them in, uh, submit them, and Shannon will read them to me, and we can actually um, we can we can basically interact. Um, but before we start, uh, we actually have set up some questions. Uh, Shannon, uh, we have a couple of questions for the audience, right? That's right. We do have some questions for you today. Um, so we're just going to put them in the chat box. Um, so the first question is, do you think COVID-19 is going to get consumers to be more interested in plant-based products? Um, so just let us know yes or no in the chat box um, right away. Yeah, so it'd be interesting to see. It's a good question to start. And so we have another question, and I'll, I'll just wait a little bit uh, before we ask that question uh, to, to the audience. So first, 2019 uh, was a really, I would say, historic year for, for uh, meat alternatives. Uh, some, some people will call them analog. Some people will call them uh, uh, fake meat products. Um, I'm not sure we've we've narrowed down the right uh, the right terms here for the future. Right now, we're just basically using plant based because I, I think it's the most suitable way of describing what's in these products. Um, 2019 was an historic year because we've seen a huge we saw a huge shift in consumption and awareness uh, around plant-based dieting, and I'll, I'll give you some numbers right now. Uh, and essentially, um, if, if uh, the, the numbers we collected, so we actually do survey Canadians on a regular basis. Before COVID, uh, we, actually, uh, we actually had uh, many consumers with no dietary preferences whatsoever. We actually had about 70% on average uh, but there is a difference between the younger generations versus the old. So 83% of, of uh, consumers uh, that were born uh, before 1946 have no dietary preference whatsoever. But when you look at millennials and the generation Zs, uh, it's quite interesting. It's below 65%. So you can see that really there is a significant difference between uh, older generations versus the young. And for people who don't keep track of generations, uh, the, oldest gener the oldest millennials this year will turn 40. So they're not young anymore. And that's almost half of the Canadian population there. And that, and that portion of the population will only uh, become bigger and more economically influential as well. Uh, and so when you think about that, uh, you're basically acknowledging that the market is going to become even more fragmented as we, uh, as we move forward. And frankly, it's been actually quite interesting to watch. Um, so I'm just looking at the results here. Do you think COVID-19 is going to get consumers to be more interested in plant-based products? 82% are saying yes, indeed. And I would say that I agree with that, uh, that statement because, um, I mean, the last 10 weeks uh, are a bit of a fog. I mean, it's been very difficult to measure what's, what's been going on because of the panic, the stress, uh, the, the, the violent way that COVID came into our lives. And of course, once we go to the grocery store, we're disciplined to death. Uh, we have to show up and we have to be greeted by a security guard, although things are loosening up a little bit, but you have to follow arrows, you have to uh, comply to certain rules. And, and I think everyone is peacefully complying, but it's just not the same thing. You just go in and, and you go through the mechanics of buying and you're not really thinking much about you know, the environment or animal welfare and things that could actually get people to think differently about meat. But I don't think it's going to disappear. Uh, in fact, I think it, it went dormant for a while, but things are going to pick up. And here are some of the reasons why I think that plant-based dieting is 
is going to actually gain momentum. First of all, and I think it's, it is the most important factor, uh, the livestock industry has not looked well, uh, really hasn't uh, been able to uh, showcase its, its, um, its sustainable nature, I guess. Uh, there's been many failures, uh, many market failures that have been reported. Uh, waste at farm gate. Uh, there, there were reports of uh, of chickens being called in Quebec yesterday. Half a million. Uh, some eggs were discarded. Mushrooms. Uh, some pigs were also euthanized in uh, in PI. I've heard. So, a lot milk. Uh, millions of liters of milk were were uh, were discarded as well. All of these incidences are. Are doing two things based on our data a lot of Canadians just don't know what to think about what, what's happening at Farmgate because on the one side farmers are saying well we're doing this because we don't have much of a choice uh, there's abattoirs are shutting down there's no market in processing and that's absolutely true they don't have a choice which really is the problem and so as a consumer, you go and say, do I want to support this or do, should we make things better or should I consider alternatives, um, when it, especially when it comes to proteins? And I think it really is going to get people to think. In fact, I actually am convinced that right now COVID-19 is, is, is serving strong case studies to the vegan movement on a silver platter. I mean, when you actually look at how some of the sectors have struggled, uh, it's very difficult to see how, um, how some groups aren't taking note. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that there are, there's been failures and I'm not even sure if things are going to change. I, I, the pandemic is, is truly the most significant crisis that I've gone through in the last 25 years as an academic. We've seen other crises before hitting livestock, like XL Foods in 2012, Listeria in 2008, BSC in 2003. And in, during these crises have failed to profoundly change the way we, we manage livestock industries, really. Uh, and it has come out as a disappointment. So when I was looking at some of the incidences that were going on, I wasn't overly surprised by that. So that's one thing. The other issue, of course, uh, that uh, is going to be top of mind is, are, are the drivers getting people to think about, uh, about alternatives? And, and those three drivers are, are pretty simple. It, it is health. Health is probably the most important one because it is self-centered. It is for moi. And all generations can actually relate to that. Um, everyone cares about their health and the health of their loved ones. And, and the case for plant-based dieting is um, not, I would say, strong, but it will get stronger because there's been talks about the fact that some of these products have been ultra processed uh, and uh, there's been concerns about sodium. And I think we all know these things, but guess what? There is such a thing as R and D and some of these products are actually getting better. I personally work with startups uh, as part of my work as an academic, I give back to, to the community and one, of, I, I give back to the communities in two ways. I actually support food banks, and I support startups, and uh, I've actually supported a few startups uh, in Montreal and Calgary around plant-based dieting, and it's been really interesting. Uh, but the focus has been R&D, to make products better. Now, on the meat side, uh, with animal proteins, undeniably, products are natural, wholesome, uh, they're of good quality in Canada. There's no doubt about that. Um, but at the same time, there's been questions about sustainability, which is why, for example, a &W has decided to go ahead with grass-fed beef because it knows that more and more people 
when they look at their plate, they actually see the planet in it. Uh, and so f because of that, you really have to change how you manage your portfolio of goods as a restaurant chain, uh, as a grocer, uh, everything. And so that's one thing. So environment, a big key, uh, a big key in decision making. So health, environment, and of course, the third one is, is animal welfare. The animal welfare one is an interesting factor because we are dealing with a public that would know very little about agriculture. I was raised on a farm. I actually know a few things about, you know, dairy farming and, and dairy genetics. And I mean, I grew up in that environment, but when you start explaining to someone who's never been on a farm, well, how dairy genetics actually work and how do you make a cow produce 10 times the milk that it would normally naturally produce uh, in nature, you can see in the eyes that something is wrong. You, you, you can, the, the translation is not going through. So there's this, this huge disconnect, uh, this huge rural urban disconnect, which is influencing demand. It's also influencing policy as well. And we, we saw it during COVID and we saw it before COVID. And so this, this divide is actually going to drive everything we do, whether it's in industry or in government, I think. And the plant-based movement, if you will, is, is part of that. It, it, it really represents what is going on. For the longest time, and this is, this is a, a, a critical remark towards agriculture in the Western world, not just in Canada, but for the longest time, uh, the, the, the industry has been overpowered by a supply chain management paradigm. We produce what we can and we'll figure out a market for it. But because of social media in particular, um, we've been forced to think the other way around. It's, it's more about demand chain management. So we basically structure an entire industry based on what consumers are looking for. And guess what? They're not necessarily looking for the things that we've supplied to them over the last five, six, seven decades. For the first time, I would say that millennials and the generation uh, Zs have said to the industry, this is not good enough. This is not what I'm looking for. Which is why I think uh, consumer choice has been undermined for quite some time up until very recently. Now, consumers have a voice through social media. And now, industry is trying to comply to this hyper-fragmentation of our food demand, which essentially is a good thing. And this is why it's a good thing, because we need to innovate. And if you only think about supply chain management, producing what you can, and then you basically try to find a market, it is much more difficult to innovate. And what we've seen in the last two, three years is way more innovation. So whether it's plant-based, juices, insects, it, it doesn't matter. The result of all this, giving a voice to consumers, uh, is, is that we have seen more innovative products. It hasn't been perfect. Of course, and there's a lot of work to be done still, whether it's at retail or in processing or even farming. But I think we're actually going in the right direction, and I don't think it's going to disappear anytime soon. Uh, Shannon, I think it's time for us to ask the next question. I agree. Um, let's see if Barb can, can get the question to show us a poll right now. But the question is, given that food prices are likely to rise over the next few years, will that make plant-based products more or less competitive? Yes or no? This is an important question, I would say. I'm going to look at the results of my speaking. Uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, this question to you guys because I think the economics of food retailing, of food in general, are going to be key coming out of COVID. 
Uh, I've always been concerned about about price points for plant-based products. I, I, I think they've been unaffordable really for quite some they've been unaccessible and unaffordable the access was kind of resolved by beyond meat beyond meat um, is is really has made plant-based products more accessible uh, more readily available uh, more convenient uh, and uh, more familiar for people, I mean, a lot of people didn't know what a vegan was, what a vegan eats, and all of a sudden you have vegan Beyond Meat offering products uh, you can feed a vegan with. <laughs> so, so you 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 you've seen a company building bridges, socio-economic bridges between different segments of the market. Uh, the Beyond Meat uh, IPO, I think, was absolutely uh, was historical, just because it, it did two things. It did it did build bridges between between uh, segments, um, addressing gaps in the marketplace. But most importantly, it has demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that plant based manufacturing is actually scalable. Um, if you would have asked me two years ago if uh, a company like Biamip would have been able to raise the amount of money it raised and has a stock price of over $100, $100 US, I would have said you're crazy. But it did happen. And as a result, you've seen more capital invested in plant-based dieting from all over the place, including Canada, which has brought more innovation. Uh, that is a fantastic legacy, I thought. And so I'm looking at the results here about affordability, and 74% uh, believe that uh, the, that uh, that uh, plant-based products are uh, going to be more competitive. So optimistic, I actually would say on this question, I'm not entirely sure. There's a lot of work to be done because to make to make a product taste good. And yes, we need to make products taste good in order for consumers to actually eat it. It also has to be affordable. And guess what? A lot of people have lost their jobs in recent weeks. And, and we're, we're about starting in September, August, September, we're going to start seeing the worst, uh, the worst recession that we've seen since the Second World War and probably before. And are people going to be able to afford two uh, burgers for eight dollars. I know prices have dropped a little bit, but this is the key here. Uh, because um, production of ingredients to make these products is supposed to be cheaper, uh, we need to build a business case for consumers eventually. I think there's been a, there was a lot of hype around, uh, around these products, but Frankly, it's just we need to make sure that these products remain affordable, and I, I think that's the key. Now, of course, we've been waiting for McDonald's to commit to plant-based, which has been which has been interesting, uh, and I haven't really kept up on what has been happening with McDonald's, uh, and because of COVID, of course, it's been complicated. But a lot of companies, a lot of chains, have committed to plant-based products, and it'll be interesting to see what McDonald's does. And that's going to be a game changer. I mean, McDonald's, when it sneezes, it affects the entire system. And uh, with the PLT being tested in Ontario right now, I would, uh, I would say if McDonald's commits to uh, the PLT, regardless how it's going to look like, uh, it is going to become a huge game changer for everyone, including retail. Now, AMW influence retail with the Beyond Burger, and we saw everyone in retail uh, adopting plant-based, and that's going to continue for a while. Uh, but I do see McDonald's um, explanation mark, I guess, uh, being quite uh, significant for, for the plant-based movement uh, coming out of COVID. I don't think it's going to happen in 2020, given what given COVID, because there's a lot of other things that we need to, to figure out. Uh, but in 2021, for example, where we're going to see 
the food inflation rate rise as everything else drops. Uh, and that's really the other issue that could actually help uh, plant-based dieting. The price of food, uh, prices are going up. Uh, it's going to go up by 4%. And next year, we're likely to see something similar just because of, of what COVID's doing to the industry. It's costing more to do everything from farm gate to plate. What you see in the grocery store is the same in processing. It's the same in farming. And so we are expecting that food inflation rate to be anywhere between 3 to 4% uh, over the next few years. Now, you may say, well, 3 4%, it's not that bad. Well, that's true. But when, when the general inflation rate is, is minus 0.2, which it is now, and it could actually drop even further, the 3 4% looks more like a 10 12%. That's the problem. That's the challenge that we're going to be facing coming out of COVID. So when you go to the, so when you look at meat counter economics, uh, with the trifecta of meat with chicken and pork and, and, and beef, and every now and then there's one product on special and, and they alternate one one week to another. And then actually came plant-based last year, which kind of disrupted this trifecta of meat, which actually made things very interesting. Well, Consumers are going to start looking at that fourth option, that fourth alternative. And price points are absolutely going to be key for everyone struggling financially. And there's going to be, there are going to be a lot of them, especially in Alberta. And so, so th th those are some of the things that, that are going to be affecting demand uh, coming out of COVID, I think, over the next few months. So that's McDonald's. Um, the, the, the other thing I wanted to mention before we go to question is, 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 is the Beyond Meat legacy. The Beyond Meat legacy was a bit problematic. Um, yes, they actually made history, did wonderful things. But at the same time, with their narrative, with the narrative of the company, uh, and if you go on their website, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's still there, but uh, they've always compared themselves with beef, uh, especially at the very beginning. We are better than beef. Uh, we're better than a real thing. And that really created a division. And uh, so when you talk to cattle producers, they don't necessarily enjoy talking about Beyond Meat uh, because they see Beyond Meat as a threat. And... I don't think it is. And in two, 2019, it was, we actually experienced the protein wars because of, of that narrative, unfortunately. Um, and in agri-food in Canada, especially in Canada, we've often looked at the marketplace as a, um, a zero-sum game. You win. I lose, I win, you lose. It's all about stomach share. So if I can't get my beef into your stomach, then I can't get business from you. But we never thought about hybrids and we've never thought about uh, coexistence. We've never thought about choice. Um, what was starting to happen in 2020 before COVID was all of a sudden, and I think that I thought that, that the livestock industry uh, started to look at the market the right way. Instead of selling calories, instead of selling proteins to people, you're selling value, which is a totally different approach, totally different, which is kind of what Beyond Me has been doing in the first place, except for that narrative part, comparing. It's been providing value to the marketplace. And, that, and their product is changing and getting better as 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 they as it moves forward and so i think the legacy of the plant-based movement is going to be grand just for that instead of looking at fighting for market share it's it's about providing value to a consumer looking to save the planet uh, a consumer looking to be kinder to animals a consumer who wants something better for their health um, 
a consumer who wants a sustainable solution. That's, that's basically what has happened. The democratization of, of proteins in general. My only concern is the price point. Price point are going to be, and, and meat prices are going up. So we need to make sure that proteins remain available to Canadians. And, and I think that's where the opportunity lies with, uh, with, with plant basin. So I have 74% of people actually saying that it's got, they're, they're going to remain pick and better. I hope so. I hope so. And I do hope that there are going to be other companies coming in to the fold to offer different kinds of products. Because right now, really, we are dealing with an unsophisticated, immature, plant-based market, if we want to call it that way. But it's going to change. People will, look, will start looking for different kinds of products. Um, the vegans are light years ahead uh, because they are pretty sophisticated. Uh, even though they are about 450, 500,000 vegans in Canada, they are seen as thought leaders because uh, they, they, yeah, I mean, if someone wants to explore the option of, of, of a plant-based product or a restaurant, a vegan restaurant, that person will ask a vegan. Uh, I certainly do that myself. I have vegan friends that I trust and uh, respect and that's going to that's going to change more and more people will get educated on plant-based dieting so as the market changes over time you'll probably see more people uh changing tastes changing habits so coming out of covid i actually am pretty confident that this hyper fragmentation of the marketplace especially when it comes to proteins will continue so on that note, I'm going to ask now, I guess, uh, Shannon to uh, provide us with some, uh, some questions. I haven't kept track, so there you go. Shannon. Perfect. And I'm, I'm going to ask Barb to help as well because you guys were so busy, so engaged. This is wonderful. Lots and lots of questions in there. Yeah, I, I was hearing a lot of ding-dings as I was speaking. <laughs> yeah. so I yeah. hope I didn't insult anyone. <laughs> no. Although I think I, I might mute the dings on the next one, <laughs> on our next series. So the first question that popped in actually, Sylvain, is a supply chain issue, that supply chain issues are going to become more critical in getting uh, quality, safe food uh, to consumers. And so he's wondering how Canada ranks in sustainable, innovative supply chains. Well, that's a good question. Actually, uh, we are... So one of our projects, we're actually working with uh, ISET in Ottawa uh, on a food innovation index. And so we're actually comparing Canada with nine other countries around the world. And that's one of the 27 metrics that we've actually uh, have identified to rank Canada's performance and supply chains are, are one of them. So it's, I, I can't tell you exactly what the results are, but uh, in fairness to this webinar, I need to kind of provide you with some information. I would say that Canada's challenge is, is space. I mean, we are far apart, very far apart. And, um, and I I'm, I've been very pleased with the work that uh, Protein Industries Canada has been doing over the last 12 to 12 months. Uh, I would say there's been... There were some great announcements, and, and if you look at, I think they had five or six different announcements just before COVID, I think within six months before COVID. And all of these announcements were related to, uh, actually had a value chain mentality embedded in all of them. So this, this super cluster based out of Regina, Saskatchewan, I think is going to serve not only the prairies well, but it actually going to allow uh, the entire industry to, to look at supply chains much more seriously. And of course, you've seen in, in Winnipeg, some major investments from, come from companies like uh, Rocket, Merit, Nestle. I mean, all of these companies are starting to invest in plant-based dieting. And as soon as you start to see these kinds of companies investing in plant-based uh, dieting, it means something. I mean, it's uh, if there are deniers out there, 
I beg to differ. It's, it's, I mean, Nestle, Nestle invested in Canada. So I think that's a signal, pretty strong signal. And Nestle has a very strong supply chain history. And so we're very, and because of our capacity in Canada, production capacity, uh, led by our pulse grows out there. And, and we've seen great companies like AGT emerge out of that. Uh, pulse Canada based out of Winnipeg is doing uh, a great job promoting what we do in Canada, producing all the pulses we need to produce plant-based products. Uh, I, I, think, I think the future is bright. Let, let me say this about, uh, Beyond Meat should have been Canadian. <laughs> I mean, Beyond Meat should have been Canadian. We just missed the boat on that one. And, uh, and that's why we're catching up. And that's, there's been some great things since April of last year happening in Canada. Right. So being that Canada is a multicultural country, says Wade, is there any focus on finding out which cultural groups will uh, help drive the growth of plant-based foods? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's potential there. Of course, there are a lot of people coming to Canada who are, who, who've immigrated to Canada or are second generation and they've never actually were raised with, uh, with meat at all. And, uh, it, I don't think we've done a good job embracing that opportunity all that much. And of course we think about milk in our dairy boards and, and quotas and, we have a lot of policy, a lot of baggage, uh, which really supports meat consumption without thinking that maybe, just maybe, people want something else or need something else for cultural reasons, religious reasons. And so there's still a lot of work to do there. Okay. Um, do you know um, offhand any demographics on the purchaser purchasers of plant-based foods, like men versus women, uh, socioeconomic? demographics yeah so so when you look at gender education uh salaries uh i hate to say this folks but plant-based dieting is seen as a diet for the elites yeah and that needs to change so if, if you want a picture uh, of, of who eats more plant-based, so in gender, more women than men. Um, and I think it has a lot to, it has to do with two things, the health and of course, uh, in our studies, we've seen that, that, uh, that women tend to, to consider holistic factors much more seriously than men. So planet, animal welfare, they're more, I'm not saying that men aren't sensitive to these the issues, but, but, but women, typically would be more sensitive to those issues than, than men. Uh, Plant-based dieters are earn more than the average uh, and uh, are more educated as well. So, and that's why I think when we think about democratizing protein or the concept of protein, we have to think about that. I mean, I actually do believe that everyone should uh, be embracing should consider plant-based dieting as a legitimate economic financial option. Okay. Um, so there's a question about our, our farming systems and are they truly sustainable? Talking about uh, crops versus uh, animal agricultural, in particular uh, grazing systems. Yeah. Uh, I think COVID is actually forcing uh, us to, to, to try to answer that question. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think uh, next week I'm actually going to be working with a group out of uh, Ottawa to look at uh, sustainable uh, supply chain models because um, there's been a lot of talks because of High River – because of, of Brooks, uh, people are starting to say, well, maybe size is an issue. Uh, we should localize production. I've, I've actually never thought that size was an issue. I think it has to, a lot to do with culture and management, uh, more so than anything else. Uh, but I think we need to have these conversations uh, coming out of COVID. Uh, and what, it, what is sustainable for Canada? Uh, 
And frankly, following the United States would be a mistake. Im implying that what goes on in the United States should be replicated in Canada would be a mistake. I think the solution has to be a, a Canadian solution, given the space and, and, and the fact that we don't necessarily have the population density that, uh, that, we, that we would find in Europe or the United States. Right. So, and I guess another question about, uh, given that artificial flavoring and other additives are a big part of plant-based products, are, I know it says safety controls possible, but I guess... Um, safety controls? Yeah, I'm not sure what they mean by safety controls, but I guess maybe more... Um, like food, food quality, yeah, tracing group quality. Supply chain. Yeah, more like quality control, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's starting to come up. I don't know if you saw uh, folks uh, recently, uh, of course, the, because of COVID, we went back to this uh, divided, divided dialogue around proteins. Uh, we've seen Beyond Meat being accused of importing ingredients from China, for example. Uh, so traceability, I think, is going to be a key issue. If, if you want to market a product, uh, you, you kind of have to be uh, to remain accountable towards the public as much as possible. Uh, and, and again, I, I don't really have any problems uh, importing food products from elsewhere as long as you're transparent about it and you give an actual choice, a, a informed choice to the public. But when, and this is the, the whole issue about plant-based dieting, I mean, and that's why I think we missed the boat with Beyond Meat because a lot of Beyond Meat products that came into Canada actually had Canadian ingredients in them. And, uh, and that, that's what Canada is all about right now. We basically produce commodities, ship it elsewhere, we buy it back in a box or in a bottle 10 times the price. So with the super cluster, with PIC, with what's going on right now, we have an opportunity to really structure – a sector the right way for Canada, for Canadians, for once. So when you talk about uh, structuring the sector, what, what do you see as the right way to structure the sector then? Uh, well, so as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, of course, you need to understand the consumer. Uh, and then, of course, retailers, then you work your way back. But the key to any supply chain strategy uh, revolves around processing. We saw that with COVID. All the failures we've seen, the waste, the closers, it's always around processing. And if we don't invest enough on processing, we're going to miss the boat. And that's exactly what's happening right now in Winnipeg, for example. And uh, I, I've heard that there's been some investments in Alberta, but I don't know for sure it's been confirmed. Uh, but the more you invest in processing, the more you're in control of the entire supply chain and you can add value based on what demand is looking for. Right. So th that, that, and that's been missing in Canada, I would right. say. So, yeah. So yeah. increase uh, processing. At yeah. our now, now Ma Maple Leaf uh, opted, Maple Leaf of all companies opt opted to yes. build its plant in, uh, in Indiana, for God's sake. I, I, I'm still, and that's, but it's not Maple Leaf's fault. Maple Leaf made the right decision for itself. We didn't build a case for, for, for Maple Leaf. I suspect that in a couple of years, and I'm hoping a couple of years, they will regret their decision. And because right now, what we're seeing is, is people getting organized. Um, like I said, I mean, I would say that the last year before COVID, We've seen tremendous progress to support um, plant-based demand over time, not only in Canada, but elsewhere around the world. So I, I'm just hoping, I'm just hoping after the pandemic, we'll continue on that path. Right. Yeah, it's a, a major goal of uh, PPAA too, to increase value-added processing industry here. Is there, is there any uh, major plants in uh, in alberta at this point not yet <laughs> okay well i know that there's a dairy plant being built in alberta that's all i heard yeah um, yeah so but that's not plant-based sorry well right. sort of 
Well, yeah, and hopefully some fractionation plants. That's what we could use as well. So exactly, but but I think I think we've turned we've turned a corner. So with with old sectors, it's always difficult to actually take that baggage and turn things around. But what I've seen, uh, the leadership I've seen so far with plant base has been pretty reassuring, to be honest. I've actually, and I'm one of the most critical ones out there when it comes to processing, but. I think we made some really darn good decisions and, and, and pick, I'm going back to the super cluster. I think pick will actually allow us to do a proper R and good R and D and it will allow us to actually build some processing capacity. And I do believe that probably down the road, Alberta will benefit from the work coming out of pick. Okay. And um, so what technical breakthroughs might make plant-based meat price um, competitive with animal-based meat? Um, so, so yeah, uh, I kind of briefly mentioned it uh, earlier, but um, this is what I think is going to happen. Um, and of course, once it doesn't happen, I'll have to explain why it didn't happen. But anyways, it's, I think, I think that our palate, our expectations around plant-based products are going to change. Because uh, right now, the market is overwhelmed with products that are, well, uh, Me Too products. They're, they taste the same. And what I've learned uh, throughout my, my time working with startups in that field is that in order to replicate what beef tastes like, you have to put a lot of ingredients that are unnatural and frankly, very costly, <laughs> very costly. The focus was to replace something. Okay. And it's been like that for a while. I think with plant-based uh, 2.0, if you will, I think we're going to start seeing uh, a, a category emerging, offering something unique and different to consumers and not just something to replace something else. It's about a di different taste. And of course, and I am Murad al Kahiba, and I've been on panels with him many times, the CEO of IGT. He, he, he says it very nicely and uh, in his own way. If, if your product doesn't taste good and it's not affordable, you're going to be out of business. And, and so I think the product did taste good, is tasting good, but it's tasting the same as well. So if, if you have, if you're dealing with an omnivore who loves beef, well, if you present him or her with a product that actually tastes like beef, why would they go with beef when it tastes like beef and it looks like beef? So you have to kind of come up with a different argument and the taste will probably come the taste will actually evolve over time. I, I think at some point we're going to have to really, we're going to see that disconnect in terms of, especially when it comes to taste and the price. Right. So, and just talking about the technology, do you see robotics, blockchain as those types of things moving more into the industry? Well, it, it's already happening actually. And you saw the failures, you saw COVID. I mean, what happened in High River, what happened in, in GBS? Do you think it would happen with, uh, with any manufacturing plants who would be manufacturing plant-based products? No, no, absolutely not. Because uh, the, product, the production is not as intensive. Uh, it's different. And the environment, of course, is very different. In an abattoir, you're in a fridge. It's humid in a you, the, the, the environment uh, for for plant-based products will be very different it won't be as intensive manually intensive so there is an opportunity for the industry to mitigate all of these risks that livestock has to deal with and frankly would be difficult for them to get rid of at this point because right. uh, labor labor is going to be an issue for everyone including including plant-based 
Okay, and just switching gears a bit into the investment realm, um, Chris says it seems like there's, you know, we hear a lot about U.S. startups closing multi-million dollar uh, funding rounds, and he's wondering what your views are on the investment landscape in Canada for food startups. <laughs> Was it meant as a joke? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the laugh is part of your answer, yes. Well, so... Yeah. Uh, like I said, I've been involved with some startups. It's been difficult, uh, to be honest. There's no, there's no money uh, as much as uh, – because, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, in the United States, you had believers for many years. Beyond Meat is a 12-year-old company, by the way. Right. It's, uh, and it's not a startup. And 12 years ago, you had a lot of people believing in that company, 12 years ago. So – in plant-based years, that's a lifetime. And, uh, and so here in Canada, well, the reason why Beyond Meat it was never Canadian is because of that. I mean, it's capital. And uh, so we're seeing some movement around greenhouses, for example. It's been tough, except Ontario. Ontario is doing very well. But in many parts of the country, capital has been hard. And uh, I actually do think that, that, uh, that uh, players like FCC, for example, if anyone out there from FCC is listening, please think about processing. Uh, I, th I know they've been thinking about processing, but they haven't committed as much as they should, unfortunately. And, uh, and banks and, uh, and why investors. Do think, why do you think that is, that they're not committing to uh, food processing? Well, it's too much risk. Uh, it's, it's risky and there's easy money to be made elsewhere. So like, look at what happened to cannabis in Ontario. I mean, all of a sudden, anybody who wanted a loan, you just said the word cannabis and they gave you millions of dollars because the yields were there and you saw the bubble collapse. And right. so at some point, I'm just hoping COVID kind of killed that bubble a little bit, but I'm hoping that bubble to, to, uh, to get bigger again so it can attract more capital, more investments, and give a shot at a lot of people who can actually launch some pretty darn good businesses. In Alberta, yesterday it was announced that, uh, that uh, the government will allow people to do their own little uh, bakeries at home, I heard. Uh, that's interesting. So I suspect there could be some interesting plant-based products coming out of, of, of some people's kitchens and to be sold at market at, uh, at farmers markets and things like that. So, uh, I don't know exactly what's going to be permitted, but a lot of consumers are going to be empowered, uh, and they're going to be asked to be thinking differently about the marketplace, which is always a good thing. Okay. Um, so I think we'll, um, have time for one last question. And so I guess, what are your thoughts or insights on fresh versus shelf stable with respect to plant based foods? And what's a desirable time frame for shelf stable? Yeah, uh, for shelf stable, I would say, ooh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the 90 day uh, threshold is always kind of a benchmark, but I would say that there's potential in both. In fact, I don't think we've explored uh, the shelf option uh, that much because it, it is going to get competitive uh, in, in the fresh sector. It's, all, it's, already, it's already competitive, uh, but I would say that people will need to think about both and uh, let me tell you, I mean, plant-based is just the beginning. I mean, we're going to see insects. Uh, we're going to see lab-grown products coming into the marketplace within the next few years. Canes will have to get used to this. So this is just the beginning. And, uh, but plant-based is undeniably very natural, uh, and it can be healthy as well. And so there's lots of potential, uh, absolutely. But there are going to be other things happening in the periphery, which could actually complicate things. And you're going to be dealing with a very confused consumer. So proposition coming out of plant-based. Okay. Yeah. So it's a protein market. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, your presentation and taking all the questions. And uh, it's been very interesting. So, and thanks everybody for your questions. So I'll just turn it back over to Shannon to wrap us up. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Barb and, and Sylvan. That was excellent questions and very interesting insights. We had- and By the way, of, Shannon, if I yeah. may, if anybody else uh, has any questions, they can always contact me through my email, no problem. Okay, perfect. Yes. So in the questions, we did the draw and Darcy is the winner. So we will send Darcy an email with, with some more information on how we can get you set up. And we will be having another webinar coming up in a couple weeks about how meatless meats are, are made. If you're wondering what's behind the curtain, what does it all really look like? Um, we'll be doing actually a, a demonstration of that. There's going to be a post-event survey. Please let us know how we can improve in the future. Mr. Charlotte Barrow actually has a really interesting podcast that I recommend checking it out. The link is there and we'll also send that out in the post-event email as well. Uh, the webinar recording will be sent out as a link about midweek next week. Uh, thank you so much everyone for attending our, our fourth webinar. This is the end of the Navigating Through Disruption series. Uh, we started out looking at finances and then we did pitting and consumer behavior. We looked at the supply chain. And then we had uh, Mr. Charlebois today to round everything off with some interesting trends in the disruption that have come out of pandemic. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, all.